big welcome from the Startup Autobahn team to probably you, your first or one of your first breakout sessions to be here today. Um, I'm really excited for this one as I've gotten to know the project team in the last uh, couple of weeks a little bit. And I'm also really, really excited about the pilot project and about the demo that they're going to um, present today. And I will try to make my intro as short as possible as we have a, a really a content packed session today. But yeah, I would like to help, uh, like how I cordially welcome the, the audience today to the session, a proactive approach to building software, code quality analysis for faster and, and higher quality software development. And I'm really happy to be here with my great speakers. From the one side, from Bosch, we have Adi Swami, um, from Embold, we have President Visharai and Sulash Ambide. And I would say, without further ado, I would like to give it up for Hari from Bosch to give a bit of an introduction to the whole context. Thanks, Adrian. I will share my screen now. So let me know when you see my screen. We can see it perfect. OK, OK. OK, so uh, thanks once again. and. Uh, let me check if my presentation works here. OK. OK, so trust me, uh, this is not a COVID center. Uh, this is our latest uh, clean room facility uh, where we manufacture high quality microcontroller chips, which we use for automotive engineering. And uh, this is a picture of you know how the clean room facility, we dress up and we take care of the quality. And what I also want to reflect upon here is we not only produce high quality hardware, but we also think about our software that goes into it. And uh, one of our missions here is to produce clean software. So good day, everybody. My name is Hari Prasad Tilakswami. I'm from Robert Bosch, India. And I lead a program called CX and DevOps, uh, where one of our missions is to uh, support the automotive divisions with their software, especially in bringing positive business impacts with CX. And here, CX means continuous X, which means you know uh, continuous coding, continuous uh, integration, deployment. You can just replace the X with anything. And today, I'm also joined by Vishal and uh, Sudarshan from Embold, uh, the co-founders of Embold. And uh, we have taken this journey on the mission to clean code continuously uh, along with them. And in some time, you will see what that is. So what's there for you today is you will be able to appreciate some of the challenges that we will see in the automotive software that is uh, uh, there for us and how we deal with it. And then also probably you will also see uh, how we can uh, solve some of those issues, especially going in the direction of the clean coding because we believe it's uh, not just important how it is done, but it's also important to get it done. So that's uh, what there is for you today. So let me take you to the ocean a little bit. Uh, there is our poor old friend, the turtle, who is stuck in between this weed of net. You know, It was not meant to be like this, but unfortunately, this situation uh, where there is this fisherman net and the turtle is stuck in this, and it is trying to desperately get out of it. It's not able to get out. But I'm not here to talk about this. So what's the problem? The problem I would ask you to imagine is, think this fishing net is like the software that we're dealing with. And the turtle there is probably the software developers, the customers, the project teams, who try to make the software work and then uh, deliver this in a clean way to the customers. So it's a very similar uh, situation. Uh, this picture here only tells you, you know, uh, how you can imagine uh, how the code becomes. And you may ask the question, you know, why is it like that? So some of the reasons for that is when you look at the automotive trend today, we are actually moving away from uh, monolithic hardware-based the systems where you have individual softwares and functions. And we are actually in the crux of moving away to you know, centralized uh, vehicle computers where you have more software intensive functions uh, which add value to the whole system. 
and uh, they are actually agnostic going to become agnostic to the kind of car that we actually have so imagine the amount of lines of code that are going to increase when you package more and more of these into a central computer so it's going to look like that weed of net that you look there and what happens is there is a bunch of defects or issues which we are already dealing with and we are just pushing it on to a bigger system and as you know with time the uh, if you let defects flow along there it just becomes more expensive so the non tangible and the tangible effects of defects are very very destructive so on the non tangible side you know you have frustration from customer we lose trust with them and on the a tangible side we lose money we have to spend a lot of time effort to get things running so this trend is actually uh, making us move away into you know the cloud based enterprise systems where the it systems typical it systems are actually coming down to the car and this makes the whole thing more complicated so how do we deal with you know this situation so let's look at you know typically how you deal with software and here uh, we have this picture called as the continuous x pipeline and uh, what it does is it's pretty self self explanatory and what you see are these three pipelines called the developer pipe the integration pipe and the test pipes where we have standard uh, routine processes or methods through which you know the software uh, code comes out to a release at the end so let me introduce you to my friend fishy and uh, what fishy does is exactly that follows the pipeline here and uh, reaches the end where uh, we can guarantee it say that you know we have reached a good quality of software and it's ready to release so the fishy here you know is trying to save the turtle stuck in that net there but hopefully it is like that but what happens is we start with the fishy here fishy starts coding and tries to find uh, what is the problem and fixes the problem and then it merges uh, whatever code it has done and then sees oh there is something wrong and then it sees okay i have a problem with a piece of code i have to fix it fixes it happily comes back and then continues on this journey where it meets the exit criteria for the integration and then goes down to do some more tests to check if everything is still working and then it's almost at the release and then again there is the traffic light which says okay hold on there are two more issues and if you don't solve that you can't release unfortunately the fish has to swim back and what fishy now sees is that okay i changed this line of code but it's affecting something else and i have now three or four more issues that i need to deal with so what's happening is it cannot proceed any further it is just stuck in the first part of this pipeline and things are just unmanageable and why is it unmanageable because of the fact of you know the complexity that we are adding every day there is no time to react to these things and we need to meet the deadlines we need to save the turtle and fishy just goes on ultimately fishy says okay i give up you know this is not possible i need some more time and it just gives up so this is a typical situation that happens in the automotive world where we have to meet conformances we need to finish all the tests and you know we need to ensure that it goes to the car key so very similar situation and the reason for that is let me take you through four topics here you know if you can deal with the software as features defects technical debts and risks and if you see the marked area here it's very easy to imagine what are your functional and non functional requirements and it's very easy to prioritize those things but what happens is the effects of coding such issues or features uh, like fixing the issues we tend to have some runtime memory corruptions or other maintainability issues which we don't immediately see and this becomes visible only when you are going to release that's a very typical situation uh, that happens to us and uh, we need to deal with it so what happens is projects and customers would say okay let's move this we understand the risk let's keep it for later and the impact of that is you tend to get involved or you get entangled with these technical debts or risks which should have been taken care of earlier so 
our software developers we need aids to produce clean software you know we can't allow this to go anymore and fishy can't save the turtle unless it gets some help so this is exactly where we want to start enabling our software developers and if you remember the pipe that i showed you earlier the developer pipe we want to introduce a transparent mechanism for fishy so that it understands this vast uh, weed of code it, it's able to visualize this nicely and then it's able to find patterns or anti patterns and uh, issues from the past if it has knowledge to those issues if we are able to provide it then fishy can do a better job at an earlier stage and imagine if we can put these as thresholds as gate before it goes down to the integration pipe then fishy uh, is able to you know give a better quality software even earlier so imagine doing this continuously from the beginning of the pipeline so this is the vision which we started with this was the mission and that's where i would like to introduce embold and our journey together we started this journey together uh, with a small poc on about five projects and today we have about 25 different projects in the braking system autonomous driving systems uh, airbags where these are mission critical uh, software systems where we have deployed embold on premises and uh, we are looking at how we can help fishy to save the turtle there so with that i hope you would be able to appreciate the challenges you know in a very simple way i try to put it with the fish and now i would actually like to hand over to vishal and sudh who will show you what we can do with them right thank you thank you thank you hari i think that was fascinating i think before we start we will like to quickly run a short poll if everybody wants to uh look at the poll section and and other questions very interesting to hear your story in in this space i will give it a couple of uh, we'll give it about 30 to 40 seconds 30 seconds to a minute let's see what what people say uh if if this is a problem that or the challenge or an opportunity that you encounter in your day to day uh, work so the question basically is how often do you postpone reducing technical debt in your release cycle okay so we are we are about to clock the minute Okay, it's very very interesting. Okay, so I think this is uh, I don't know if we close it, but it's very very interesting to see that um, the majority of people delay it between two to twelve months, and it's completely understandable. So, I think with that, that really sets the context, and I would I'd like to open this discussion um, by 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 you know I'm fascinated with the automotive industry, and I always take the example of the messaging world. I don't know if how many of you remember when when messaging started it was called SMS. I mean that's from what I remember, and you needed a hardware device, a Nokia or an Ericsson or a Motorola device to send a message. So you could not send SMS to someone unless you had hardware. And slowly the the hardware abstraction, you know, started happening between software. And today, you know, today SMS industry is virtually dead. It's still it's still existing in some countries, but. In, in largely people have moved on to uh, messaging without the dependency on hardware um, and i see a similar i mean uh, do you and hari the question is do you see a similar abstraction happening in the automotive industry which will completely change the dynamic of how oems or tier ones operate today would you would love to hear your thoughts on that yeah exactly i i think that's a brilliant uh, analogy to you know what's happening to the automotive world and uh, like i said we you know you go out of these monolithic systems to the central computers where uh, the functions that we are working today will actually become software intensive applications 
and uh, you are no longer dependent on the hardware that it runs on. Now you're so agnostic to the hardware, it becomes so intensive. It's uh, it, you can just push it down as a service to your uh, hardware that is there. You know, so a very very similar trend that's happening. Great. So do you think do you think in the future, Bosch or or some of your peers could transform to being like the Amazons of the automotive industry of the world? Do you do you foresee that? Absolutely. Absolutely, and uh, that's uh, one of the things that we would love to do. And uh, we want to work with our customers and our clients. Uh, you know, look at how Amazon is doing it, right? So we see similar things where we can push software uh, to the car. Uh, it will also talk back. You know, you would also get feedback from the car where so you have services running around this. So very similar approach, actually. Correct. Okay. Um, amazing. I think that is going to be the other tectonic shift that we see in the technology world that they'll be coming together. And I right. think with the amount of software that is being, that's going to be written. And as you rightly said, your, your continuous X model is going to be even more critical and, and the impact of, of finding issues even more important early on, as you said, because your, your smallest, your weakest link can impact millions of billions of, of components. Right. Is that right? right? Okay, great. I think so. That's a great opening line, uh, and that is why I think uh, I think uh, companies like Bosch, you know, global leaders are are, are looking at at delivering world class software. And as I said, software is is you know, software problems are no longer one dimension. Um, you know, earlier I would say you know you and and you have a tool, you find the problem, and you do it. But today, uh, given what Hari said, Hari said, and and where this industry is going. Where you know you're going to be running, you know, just like Amazon, tons of services across billions of devices and locations and objects. Uh, you need to attack the problems of code quality through a multi-dimensional approach. It has to evolve. And I think with that, I'll, I'll open up to, to uh, Imbold's co-founder and CTO, Sue, to talk a little bit about Imbold and, and uh, the product and, and, what, and, and take it forward. Sue, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hari and Vishal uh, for, the, for the excellent background. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Sudarshan. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the platform and why we built it, and uh, a bit of the collaboration with Bosch, along with a, you know a small demo. So as Vishal mentioned, uh, so the nature of defects in the software uh, today they are not just bound to you know code code quality problems, but they are also attributed equally to architectural and design flaws. So you need tools which not only analyze uh, systems from code quality perspective, but you also need a holistic approach which looks at the system as a whole and then surfaces problems related to architecture and design. And these are the issues which are typically harder to fix compared to the ones that are found at code level. And that's exactly what Embold does. It is a multi-dimensional analyzer. It's a rule-based engine which looks at architectural design, code compliance, and, and, and duplication in other metrics. And then it has a neural network-based analysis uh, for defect prediction. So this is really interesting because it not only looks at uh, you know the current state of the so software, but it look it goes back in time. So which means it connects with the defect tracking systems of your software, or it connects with the version control systems, and then it looks at all the changes that have happened over time in terms of uh, new defects added or fixed, or new code commits that were introduced to fix those defects, and then using that it builds a repository of let's say code patterns which are responsible for those defects and also the ones that are fixing those defects. So in a sense, uh, Embold is a combination of rule-based analysis, which performs uh, architecture design and code quality checks, and an AI-based engine, which does defect prediction by mining historical data and then using that in the present. The whole intention there is to help developers avoid you know, making the same mistakes again. So as Hari mentioned in the beginning, so Embold is uh, available on-prem, which means that it can be trained, it can be deployed completely within the enterprise network. The training happens on the uh, on, on your own systems, and then uh, it's completely sandboxed inside your, your enterprise environments. So coming to uh, quickly uh, our collaboration with Bosch. So as Hari, Hari talked about uh, some minutes ago, we started with the POC uh, with a couple of programs which was successful. And then we started rolling it out to 25 mission critical and safety critical systems. These are the ones that power the critical components of the, of the car. 
And this, these represent you know, millions of lines of code written in C and C++ with a lot of changes over time. And they are continuously being modified with new features and new releases. And that's the, that, those are the ones that we, uh, we deployed Emboldt for. And when we started the rollout, we also saw that you know, some of those programs are using Git as the version control system, which we already supported. But then a lot of them were using the IBM RTC system for, for you know, change management and defect management. So what it means is for Embol to effectively use the defect prediction engine, uh, it had to integrate with RTC so that it could pull out all the historical defects and commits and correlate and connect all the dots so that it could build a model uh, which can then use uh, which can then be used to predict defects in the code that that is being written today. So Embol is deployed with those two components, so the rule-based engine which is analyzing code, analyzing architecture and design flaws surfacing hotspots and issues, and then helping developers with impact analysis. And the AI-based defect prediction engine, which is working in the background, and this engine is looking at uh, the history. It, it keeps itself updated with all the commits that are made uh, over time. And then whenever it finds, let's say, uh, a code pattern which was responsible for a defect, maybe in the last release, it alerts the developer saying that, hey, you made, uh, you made this commit sometime back. And this commit resembles something that I've seen in the past. And this commit was linked to issue number 25, which was maybe a critical problem. And that's why you need to investigate this. Otherwise, it may create a regression issue. And then, and then the developers can get alerted at the development cycle so that they can avoid you know, these kind of def defects escaping into you know, QA or into production. So this is how it is deployed. Uh, and then as Hari mentioned at the beginning, so Embold is deployed in the DevOps tool chain of, of these 25 uh, programs, which means it is continuously monitoring all the code changes that are happening and then uh, surfacing issues as, as it sees them. And then the defect prediction engine also highlights code patterns which are known to be uh, you know, defects which are found in the history of the system. And the unique thing about this is because uh, Embold trains on the history of your own code base, yeah, the, 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 the resulting model is very, very specific uh, to that kind of, uh, to, to, let's say to that system or to a set of systems, uh, which means the kind of issues that it finds are also unique to that domain or unique to that particular system, which makes it even more effective in terms of uh, you know, identifying and fixing the right kind of defects. So with this, I would just quickly switch to uh, a demo of how, how this works and just show it in action. Let me just... Switch my tab. All right, so here, uh, this is the uh, Embold dashboard with some example projects. Let's jump into one of them. Let's say OpenCV, which is primarily C++ with a bit of C. What you see here is a high level dashboard uh, of this project. Uh, you can see it has 123 hotspots, which are really problematic components uh, from the design perspective or code quality or security perspective or, or a combination of all of these. And then you also see that this has the system has a score of 1.15 on a scale of minus 5 to plus 5. So with this, you can compare, let's say, OpenCV with other systems in your, let's say, business unit or other programs that you're monitoring. Uh, you, get, you get an objective view of where uh, where it stands, stands in terms of uh, software quality. I can jump into the hotspots in the system, for example, which are the top 20 most problematic components in this in the system from overall perspective, and then again from the design metrics and duplication and code quality perspective. So I can jump into, uh, let's say, a particular piece of code. In this case, uh, this is a C++ class. And here I get hints and you know, insights on the exact issues that were found from the design perspective. For example, this was a GOT class with a fat interface with, you know, a lot of dependencies. So these are design issues which were found by analyzing this class or this component in relation with all other components in the system and, and, and looking at things like separation of concerns or lack of abstraction. So those are the uh, like global data, for example. So those are the things that we look at when we do design analysis and then surface these kinds of issues. 
Similarly, you can see it has some critical code issues. It has a lot of metrics violations and about 12% of code is duplicated. And then you can drill down into the exact issues and get some explanation and some context on, on that specific occurrence of that issue so that you can get some support in fixing that issue. You can also navigate through dependencies from that component to other parts of the system as a network of dependencies. And this becomes important because if you're dealing with large monolithic systems with a lot of entangled code, you want to visualize that, you want to identify cycles or cyclic dependencies. And in the end, you want to simplify this. You want to, you want to get an objective view of uh, how much complexity is really there. And then what are the ways to actually simplify or fix uh, these design, uh, you know, design issues. And that's where some of these uh, recommendation engine uh, components come in. So what, what you're seeing here is you know, a refactoring recommendation from the design perspective for the module that we are right now looking at. And the solution here is to break it down into smaller modules. And what you see in this picture is, so the system is telling us which modules you can create, which functions you can pull out from the existing code, and what should be the new resulting structure so that these design issues are addressed or at least the severity is reduced. So these kind of hints from, from the design perspective go a long way you know, for developers, designers to get insights into refactoring and then uh, you know, save, effectively save a lot of time when, when modifying or refactoring design. So all of this is coming from the uh, you know, rule-based perspective or the rule-based analysis engine that I talked about. And now let's look at uh, how the defect prediction works with, with the AI approach. So I'm just looking at another project. So this system, uh, we have trained this, we have trained a model uh, from GitHub. Uh, and uh, so the defect tracking system came from Jira. And at the end of it, so it is predicted that the, some of these recent commits were found to be problematic. And then you can drill down and then look at exactly what, what the system suggested. So in this example, you can see that there is a code block of about 10 lines of code, which, it, which the system flagged as a potential issue because it has seen these patterns in the history of this system itself. And these patterns were responsible for this particular issue, which was indexed from, from Jira, from Apache Jira. So what it is telling us is, uh, look at this piece of code, because this, this change may reopen or reintroduce a Jira ticket, which was previously found and fixed. And that's why you should investigate, otherwise you can create a regression. So if you look at this, uh, this kind of rule or you know issue prediction is not done by writing a rule specifically to look for this problem but the rule is actually uncovered from the history of this of the system and it only gets better as it sees more and more commits passing through the system and and the kind of issues that could get flagged could be anything from functional problems like this which could be a functional issue to let's say security issues or missing api calls or even uh, you know, non-functional problems, depending on what is in the history of, of this particular system. So that's how this works uh, in a nutshell. And, uh, and over to you, Michal. Great, great. Thanks, Sue. So uh, I think just for the larger audience of late, you've been reading a lot about GitHub's Copilot. Uh, well, in, in words, uh, this feature is pretty much in, in, in general like Copilot, but invented a year earlier. And the nice thing about uh, about this this feature is it works on an enterprise data. So there's you know just like the, unlike the controversy that's been happening with the Copilot training data, you know training on everybody's data on GitHub and then using it for for features. Um, this uh, the Mold's Copilot, if I were to call it, works only on your internal data. It doesn't it doesn't uh, dilutes its learning from external data because the application is very enterprise specific, and I think that is one of the biggest values. Uh, that's as okay. So I think thanks, Ruth. I think that was a great demo. So now uh, coming to the pilot. So maybe uh, Hari, I like a qu very very concrete question. Can you take some real example of how you use uh, our AI and whether you were you were able to find any clear issues that your existing tool sets couldn't find? And could you mm -hmm. could you share that with an example, please? Yeah. Uh, so this was very interesting given for us, you know, the pattern based and uh, what we did actually to evaluate it was uh, we put some of the defects into our code purposely. We put it into it 
as a pattern to just see if the uh, system recognizes it and uh, we did it in you know one of the over the air update uh, you know which is commonly coming up in most of these systems now and uh, we put this pattern into one of these uh, modules and uh, believe me uh, if you run uh, qac logiscope or any one of these they will not find it because the code is working but what the recommendation engine did for us was to piece of code that was uh, missing and uh, this has been fixed in this way and uh, it identified that you know the pattern was pretty clear and these are some things which uh, we would have not noticed it you know until you started testing it or you know it's already late for delivery so i think that was a very concrete example which we really put in and we got these uh, you know measures we looked at it and it's uh, you know showing us the results yeah, yeah. thanks thanks for everything yeah so i think it it really emphasizes that uh, you know you can there's only a, a you cannot write rules for every check and especially Absolutely. you cannot write write rules for checks which are very unique to a repository and that's where you have to depend on techniques like neural networks learning from the past so so thank you thank you hari i think that's a great example thanks vishal yeah now, so, yeah so so you think we you know we've done a lot of you know work in the automotive space we've seen hundreds and millions of lines of software have you seen some generic patterns identified by our by our engine that you can share uh, across the industry maybe three or four yeah so uh, actually yes uh, so we have seen we have seen automotive stacks across the different layers of the system and what we have typically seen is especially when it comes to uh, you know the algorithmic code that is out there could be uh, autonomous driving systems and other critical programs so that is complex software i mean it it, it is, what it does is complex but it need not be complicated and what we have seen uh, as a pattern is this software this piece of code is usually complicated in the sense that it 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 does multiple things in, in a single module and then it lacks some separation of concerns and and stuff like that which makes it even harder to to understand and 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 evolve it because of its inherent complexity so that's one of the uh, common patterns that we that we've seen the other one uh, is also that because uh, these uh, you know the, these stacks are to support different chipsets and different hardware target pl platforms a lot of code is conditionally compiled into the system and uh, it it may be started off as a few variants but then over time you have to support 10s and 15 and 20 20 different variants and then you end up having a lot of conditionally compiled code uh, which which becomes really hard for developers to to maintain and then they could in, unintentionally introduce defects when fixing one variant and then it doesn't work on another variant for example so that's another common pattern uh, that we've seen the other things that we also also seen is uh, because it is a, it is mix of c and c++ there is always uh, sometimes this mix of programming paradigm which means that there is monolithic piece of c code interspersed with some c++ constructs and then that usually doesn't go well together and that creates uh, you know maintainability and defect you know defect prone components uh, that's also another another area that we have seen also in multimedia we have seen uh, and components are interacting with bluetooth drivers and cd players and and those components there is not enough standardization which means uh, you know those are the components which are directly user facing and that's why it is important that stability and usability is important and then we have seen issues in in some of those areas as well all of them are pointing to architectural code quality issues which can definitely be addressed by by tools and uh, you know uh, architectural decisions yes okay. okay great so i think i think uh, i uh, i have no more questions and i think we would now probably open this uh floor up for the audience to to share any questions they have and we'll try and see if we can so we've got one question coming in um this is from aaron which says uh, do we have long term experience that shows positive changes over time especially with regards to team performance like lead time or defect metrics Uh, so, so um, uh, direct metrics that we report, uh, Aaron, do not give these metrics, but we have all the data that you need to derive this uh, as well. So there is an API that we have which you can use to build your own performance uh, team performance dashboards. So I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, 
okay uh, can the involved model can the involved uh, you know can it learn from a model from one system applied to the other so do you want to take that question yeah so uh, currently it works it, you combine multiple systems inside a model which means uh, if you are let's say developing stack which represents multiple code repositories you can combine them inside a single model uh, we are also working on the transfer learning so where you can train model on one repository and deploy it on another uh, that's something that's on our roadmap Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so yeah, how is my data handled in Imbold? So, so the data is 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 secure. So, if you install Imbold and the neural network in your network, the data remains there. So, when when Imbold is installed for the first time, you get a black, you know, completely clean, you know, unlearned model and then you tra it trains on your data set um, so it's completely uh, in the customer's network nothing leaves the customer's network okay and in the end we have another poll so after, after we get the questions going let's wait for the uh could you provide uh, provide another summary of another use case of embold in a different industry so uh i, I mean we there are customers of embold uh are across industries you know ranging from pharmaceutical companies who are building vaccines to help people in covid 19 you know some of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world are using embold as a part of their pipeline um you have companies building you know in the, in the space technology using it to build space tech so it's basically, I mean, if you look at the industry, every company is a software company today, and every company which is offering services which affects the life uh, of, of people and business, uh, you know, they have to take software very seriously, and the problem has become multidimensional. So, 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 so those are some examples where any industry that, that is really, uh, and like as Hari said, automotive industry, you know, we were joking that, that uh, the Hari, the, the, the challenge Hari has is, I mean, you have uh, companies building rocket ships, so they take six, six years, three to six years to build a spaceship, they send this shuttle up uh, because, and they spend a lot of uh, time in improving the quality, but in the automotive industry, the self-driving cars, autonomous platforms coming in, it's as as risky and as, in, you know, as serious as rocket ships. But here, these guys have to have to release the software every three months and launch, you know, for a billion rocket ships, right? That's how, that's how uh, mission critical it is. And, and the industry doesn't realize it. How, how 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 it is and they are now because as you know very very rightly said how absolutely. Do you think you yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, we are into mission critical systems, you know, imagine your uh, father, mother, your, you know, your sibling, sister, somebody in the car and uh, imagine you have these quality problems in the car and, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't work the way it should work. So you are actually looking at millions of such uh, devices on the road and, you know, it, uh, I think the analogy with the rocket, of course, the rocket is just going up and there is more, so it's more sensitive. Uh, but in this case, you know, we are uh, in the mission to save lives every day. So it becomes even more critical, actually. Right. Okay. Okay, great. How is it different from uh, other static analysis tools? So great question. So I think um, there are great static analysis tools in the market. They are bottom-up tools. Imbold is a top-down analyzer. Uh, you know, most static analysis tools are, are they look at code issues, they do a great job. Imbold approaches code analysis multi-dimensional from get go. So, you know, we, we analyze code on all dimensions. In addition, Imbold, as a suit said, is a combination of rules-based analyzing. So that's a traditional or legacy analysis analysis, you know, we keep where you define the, how many rules you have. But we enrich that with a neural network, which is which is very unique. So it it basically learns from your historical data and ensure you don't make the same mistakes. And and remember, software development is no longer a repo based environment. You know that was the past. SVN Git. Today, your whole software has has a has an had islands of very very good data being developed. You know your Jira data or your logs data, and all of them are handled and offered through very powerful APIs. And you can and so the neural network 
you know, can take that data and enrich the analysis. So that's how that's how Inboard is different. It's 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 a multi-dimensional analyzer, top down, which applies the best of rules-based analysis and neural network-based analysis, you know, to offer the best experience to customers. So that's how we it, it's different from other static analysis tools. Okay, I think we can get going then with the, with the poll and then after that conclude our session. Yeah, yeah, so there's another poll that's gone up. Yes, yeah, so the any AI based platforms in your DevOps workflows and the options are yes, I have. I'm planning to in the future or no. Ten seconds more. Okay. And I think that's a good prognosis for the future that a lot of you are willing to use them in the future or are already using them. I think that's a Great message for the end. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much to our amazing panelists today. Um, I thought that the discussion and the demo and the general presentation was really interesting. And I'm sure that the um, audience thought so as well. And yes, I would say thank you from the Startup Autobahn team, also for the great organization with you. And to the audience, enjoy the rest of the day, enjoy the rest of the sessions or live panels, discussion, and I hope to see you soon again. And with that, I would say goodbye from, from me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you